good with the computers. Uh, good morning. I uh, would like to begin by making the obvious joke that after the amazing uh, Elitzer talk, uh, those of you who are not in physics or philosophy will see that it's great because if physics is controversial and philosophy is not, as against the common sense impression that physics is all established and uncontroversial and philosophy is a mess of warring factions. So this will actually be a rather calm, expository, pre-lunch, uh, you know, warm down after the exertions of the last two talks. Um, I, I would like very much to thank uh, Hugh and George and Rod for all the arrangements and uh, obviously Templeton Foundation for all this uh, wonderful funding and a wonderful venue we've come to. Uh, as the abstract says, I want really to, um, and this will partly collect uh, discussions that came up yesterday, um, I want to actually tell you in two stages about uh, two particular papers by John Ehrman. Uh, one is about growing time and one is about branching time. Uh, the one about growing time is especially about C.D. Broad, yet going back to Hugh's comments about Cambridge philosophers, he's another one. Uh, he advocated growing time, and Ehrman has a paper assessing Broad's proposals, which um, uh, brings out features that the literature on Broad hasn't, and uh, mm -hmm. Ehrman's paper merits uh, scrutiny. Uh, as to branching time, uh, Ehrman has in his sites uh, a school of thought not represented here, namely... Uh, Newell Belknap, a Pittsburgh logician, together with younger co-authors in, uh, in Europe, um, especially Muller and Platzek, have developed formal models of branching time and branching space-time from the point of view of uh, logic, especially, coming from the logic rather than the space-time or physics end of th things. And Ehrman uh, does a critique in effect, a critique of their proposals, which slightly misses the target, as I'll discuss, but again, there's material that's worth thinking about, it seems to me. So that, that's, um, that's really what I want to do. There's going to be two stages. Uh, there's going to be the proposal that time grows. Um, and this, of course, echoes George's talk. And then there's going to be the proposal that time branches towards the future. Now, the um, background for me and for Ehrman here, and for all of us to some extent, is the discussion of determinism, which I haven't defined, and there are various definitions. We were, it'll only come up at, towards the end that there's a, a, a main difference between the way Ehrman and the Belknap School discuss it, uh, or define determinism, uh, but... <coughs> For the most part, we will tend to think that if you're dealing with growing time, you're in a philosophical dispute about uh, whether the block universe view is right, which would uh, apply uh, under determinism, right? Because there's, after all, only the one future. Uh, whereas the branching space times, obviously, seem to be in an indeterministic scenario. So broadly speaking, first half, you can imagine determinism is in... Ha is in play. Second half, you'll obviously be thinking that indeterminism is in play. The, um, the, the other things I'd like to, to say at this stage early on uh, is that um, it came up yesterday uh, with George's talk and I think Hugh Price's that um, this the, the that uh, Fay and Ra Raphael replied to Hugh that it, it, it could be um, heuristically valuable, even if there is in fact one single total history, uh, to think of it in terms of uh, a sequence of its initial segments, because uh, you are imagining some probabilistic process that produces this total history. So the background here is really, in my opinion, setting aside the details of individual theories, that there is, of course, a mathematical equivalence between a sequence, 
say, a sequence of real numbers, just a n, 0, 2.5, 3.17, comma, 17, a sequence of real numbers like that is mathematically equivalent, of course, to the set of all its initial segments. Given the sequence, you can go back, you can thereby determine all of its initial segments. And if I give you all of its initial segments, you, there's a highly redundant specification of the whole sequence. So the first thought that you'll have when you first meet uh, Broad <laughs> saying, ha-ha, reality grows, is something like, well, doesn't the block universe and the broad growing block, in some sense, aren't they both equivalent uh, because of this uh, mathematical equivalence that one can see even in an elementary case like, like a sequence? And it's a reasonable suspicion, but I think there are, in effect, uh, three comments, first philosophical, secondly physical, to make about it. The, the philosophical reason why it's not a straightforward equivalence, you haven't completely dissolved the dispute, uh, is that um, what philosophical issues about what is real typically outstrip technical mathematical equivalences. So even if there is a mathematical equivalence between two items, alpha and beta, alpha might be the best way to think of it philosophically, philosophically superior. Um, more specifically, when we talk about this broad proposal and Ehrman's assessment of it, uh, we'll see that Ehrman uh, talks about cheating and non-cheating versions of the broad model. And this is really uh, a matter of, uh, so to speak, having what's conceptually prior, what's uh, reasonable to assume, take, to take as your premise. So uh, those disputes about what's conceptually prior to what and what's reasonable to take as your premise are things that are bound to be in play even after you've accepted a mathematical equivalence. And the third reason why this equivalence between a sequence and the set of all of its initial segments is uh, not an immediate dissolution of these disputes is uh, this uh, Fay and Raphael point that uh, a theoretical framework can find it much more natural to look at one mathematical object rather than a mathematically equivalent object. And if you believe in a stochastic process uh, uh, as governing the generation of this sequence, it can be vastly more um, appropriate. It may be the only thing you can do to think of it as uh, uh, given by the set of initial uh, segments rather than as an entire sequence in itself. Or to put it in more technical terms, if you believe in a probabilistic process producing the, the, the sequence, it may be impossible to state the measure on the set of infinite sequences, but much more tractable to state the measure, to specify the measure in terms of the transitions from one initial segment with, say, 17 elements to the one with the next one with 18 elements. Okay, well, that's by way of landscape, you know. Um, let me get down to details then. Um, so that what I'll do is I'll talk first about the growing, then about the branching, and about the growing, there'll be three subsections, and about the branching, there will be two. And uh, as I say, in the background for the growing, there's a single history, so you can imagine determinism. Uh, for the branching, you're bound to be thinking of indeterminism. Uh, there'll be some fancy formalism <laughs> of the philosopher's type, namely angle brackets, you know, specifying a triple of items. Uh, but there won't be any real uh, technicality. Uh, and in particular, there'll be no quantum. This is why it's so uncontroversial compared with the previous talk and also Wayne's talk. There'll be no quantum, and there'll be no brave attempt to cope, really, with the dynamical nature of space-time, okay? Though there will be mention of general relativity. Anyway, so let's begin with the Newtonian case, growing time. And so this is, um, uh, in effect, uh, a simple-minded start. Uh, Ehrman has a delightful pair of names 
A block universe person like Price or Butterfield is called a blockhead, right? <laughs> uh, you might, this might suggest Dummkopf to some of you, but I would, of course, uh, disparage any such connotations. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, a, someone who believes in the growing uh, is a broadhead, right? <laughs> and in fact, if you're an English schoolboy or were, uh, once, you, this will vaguely remind you of cavaliers and roundheads, but uh, in any case, a Newtonian block model is then to be on R4, so this act, we're going to have, this could be altered, but we're going to, for simplicity, have an infinite past. Uh, and GI is typical philosopher's uh, kind of uh, mathematician Monquet notation. GI is the collection of geometric objects that specify lengths and times on the space-time, and PJ are the physical fields, the matter, the radiation, the particles. And one of these geometric objects is this uh, famous Newtonian absolute time function, capital T, which takes values between plus and minus infinity on the real line. And as, New as Ehrman puts it, uh, there's the Newtonian block, and there are chips off the old block, right, or chips off the eternal block, if you like, um, namely, we build up Broad's vision in a parasitic or cheating way in the first instance to get a handle on it by looking at, for every time capital delta, the truncated Newtonian model, which is literally space-time up until the time slice specified by capital T being delta. And the Broadian, uh, the Broadhead model, based on this collection of chips off the block is the, all those chips ordered by the relation I've written kind of curly, pre, le, less than or equal to, a kind of precedence relation, and I just say that one chip is less than the other if it's time label, delta is less than the other. We, in this way, uh, Curly less than, which I'll from now on call for just so as to speak English rather than saying things like less than. Let's call it precedence. Precedence has immediately inherits the order structure of the real numbers from these delta, these values delta. It's a total <coughs> a linear relation. It's dense and it's it's continuous. Okay. Dense just means that between any two points there's a third. Continuous takes longer to say, but it's all to do with, it's just a, a property of the real numbers. It's got the least upper round property is another way to say it. Okay, but can we be less cheating? Could broad be less cheating? Well, one way to be less cheating is to say uh, there's going to be a collection, big N for Newtonian, but it's now not calligraphic, it's some other typeface, but call it big N. Each element of this collection, each element little n, is indeed isomorphic to a chip of some Newtonian block model or other, but I'm not saying they're all the same block model. And the precedence relation is defined by embeddability, so I'm now no longer referring to time labels capital delta. I'm just saying there's a collection of these truncated models, which you've gathered, you know, like a beach coma from various Newtonian models you might be lying about, you truncate them in arbitrary ways, and you ask about the embeddability relation. Well, this embeddability relation, this precedence now, is indeed a pre-order, it's reflexive and transitive, but it needn't be asymmetric. Two, two distinct such little n can be embeddable one into another. So it's not, a, it's not an anti-symmetric relation. Uh, if you have no B-series change, or if you have strictly periodic uh, eternal recurrence type uh, Newtonian block, uh, and you take chips, then you can have mutual embeddability of chops, chips that are distinct. It's also true, then, that this precedence needn't be connected, in the sense that any two things, uh, for any two little n and little n dash, there's some chain whereby of under precedence, back and forth zigzagging that leads from the one to the other. Nor need it be dense, nor need it be continuous. So 
if Broad sets out to, in some <laughs> sense, recover the metaphysics and perhaps the physical description of the world given by a block model, uh, the simplest general way that Broad could do that is to presumably require that all the elements of our capital N, our collection of uh, uh, truncated models, are chips off the set one and the same Newtonian block. Uh, and the overall uh, game here it goes back to that Russell joke about complaining that after some arduous piece of... Uh, Russellian, you know, logical construction of some familiar object as an arcane, set theoretic, uh, highly structured entity. He, he would, you know, declare with pride that he had told you that Piccadilly Circus was actually a set of sets 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 of equivalence classes of sense data, right? So he'd exhibited Piccadilly Circus as some wonderful logical construction and then say that his enemies or his opponents in philosophical discussion had got all the advantages of theft over honest toil. You know, he'd be proud that he achieved, honest, done something about honest toil. So obviously the broadheads want to not assume too much. They need mild and honest non-cheating conditions on their truncated models in such a way that perhaps that something like they can prove that for any uh, such big N ordered by their precedence relation, there's a Newtonian block into which each little N can be embedded. And under some ass assumed determinism, this uh, Newtonian block, curly N, calligraphic N, would be unique. So they'd be thinking of a blockhead model as an ideal completion, but as a metaphysically uh, alluring but deceptive, right? Um, and uh, we, we blockheads have been uh, misled into believing that that's the way to think of reality. Okay, so what about the relativistic case? Well, now we proceed in two stages. One is to imagine that there's a hypersurface, which is the George Ellis way, and the other way, which we'll come to later, is to imagine that the reality grows in terms of uh, the past light cone. So let's suppose that we have a relativistic block model which is, um, admits a global time function. Uh, this is, a, as we'll discuss, in fact, it's already on this slide, this is not generic. But a relativistic block model, curly R for, R for relativity, is a manifold, a uh, four-dimensional manifold. There's the G sub I again, but in fact all, that, all you need is a single object, the metric little g, and the matter fields or radiation, matter and radiation or particles, the Pj. So there's some uh, function, this is the cousin of the capital T of absolute time of the previous section, uh, there's a... And it has a lower bound L and upper bound U, both of them real numbers. They might be plus or minus infinity. So uh, what you would then expect is that the cheating construction of a broadhead model, call it curly B based on curly R, would carry over with uh, this little t replacing our Newtonian absolute time, capital T. And you would sort of expect that the less cheating construction would also carry over, and most of the assessment of exactly what it is legitimate for a broadhead to assume, uh, or what is uh, theft, what is honest toil, that kind of assessment should perhaps carry over. But there are various comments where one, about the difference that one needs to make. First of all, uh, having a global time function is not generic. So there is an issue. Should the broadhead cut down the set of acceptable models or modestly claim the broadhead becoming only for the actual cosmos? And this is something that came up in, in George's discussion. Uh, and there's, of course, a general tension between the philosophers who tend to be armchair types who want their theories to be, uh, if not uh, necessary and perhaps if not analytic, at least uh, not too dependent upon the actual laws of nature, but, but to be more general features of uh, how reality could be, since, after all, uh, they don't know the laws of nature and uh, uh, don't even know much about today's best guesses about the laws of nature. So... A second comment, 
would be that if there's a global time function, then there's continuously many such. And in fact, two such functions can match up to some hypersurface and uh, then differ thereafter. And if you happen to know of the whole argument, then you'll know that this kind of uh, matching up until a time and then an arbitrary twiddle afterwards uh, can uh, suggest a radical indeterminism. So, uh, without further specification of uh, there is a threat of a radical indeterminism about the facts of becoming. So there are various ways that you might try to privilege one global time function over the others, uh, but various natural ways apply to a limited class of models, um, and uh, some natural limitations don't yield a unique function or even a foliation. Uh, and I've given an example there referring to a thing called global hyperbolicity, which is a, an appropriate assumption for setting up a kind of Laplacian determinism for the entire space-time. But if there's one such uh, uh, Cauchy surface, globally hyperbolically uh, favored time function, there are continuously many by making some, some local wrinkle. But this is something that uh, I won't pause on since we had a, a specific proposal from George, which uh, we can... Uh, which is in no way uh, dismissed by that slide. So that's kind of a slide written independent of George's proposal. Um, a radical response to these issues of non-uniqueness non of the uh, uh, time function is to uh, take that the actual history is actually to be given by a class of all the possible choices you can make. Uh, so now there's what you might call uh, a bit too much becoming or uh, a plethora of becoming. Perhaps the broadhead should glory in this. There is a, a minimal objectivity secured by the fact that all the elements uh, uh, of this vast class have the same block model as their ideal completion. And again, one can envisage representation theorems where one can discuss the cheating, the honest toil, or the theft. But let's take a look at the other broadhead program of world line becoming. So the idea is that, uh, going back to the wonderful <coughs> file quote that Hugh reminded us of about the, the world line goes up the page, as, uh, crawling up the, the page. So there, let's imagine a past and future endless world line gamma and maybe it is of some privileged sort. For example, it's a geodesic. Uh, and uh, would nevertheless to, to imagine that becoming is relativized to this world line in some way, even though there are lots and lots of world lines. So the, the cheating construction uh, of a world line relativized becoming model would then proceed something like Again, we're going to truncate, given the block model. Uh, so there's curly R, the relativistic model. Uh, at any point P, there is its past light cone. And this is written as J minus P. The minus connotes past. And the J connotes that we're including the boundary uh, of the light surface. So it, it, J minus P is the set of all those points, call them Q, such that there is, from Q to the first chosen point P, a curve that goes at most as fast as light. It may be uh, sometimes light-like, it may be always light-like, but it's not faster than light. So I can, given an R, delete from R all the points that are future to this past light cone of P. So this is the analog of the, of the truncation that we first began with by saying, forget everything to the future of an of a absolute time slice labeled by capital delta. Now we're deleting everything to the future of a past light cone of a point P. And uh, the... Uh, Definition of precedence is simply uh, that one can uh, that one uh, past light cone is a subset of another. Okay, so that's the obvious analog of the cheating construction. 
However, we don't want to favor one particular world line, so it is natural to, uh, to require that... Um, uh, so, sorry, two, two points. It's, it, we don't want to favor one particular world line. We wish to generalize over different world lines. And furthermore, we want, as you go along a world line, uh, that there should be an increase in the total, total existence. So if Q is in less than R, that means that, that uh, Q is uh, connectable to R by a future-directed uh, time-like line. Uh, the uh, total past of Q should be a subset of the total past of R. And uh, this is actually uh, entailed by requiring that... Uh, th this means a proper subset here in, uh, in the line two of the slide. This is entailed by this condition that any two distinct points have distinct causal pasts. This is much weaker than the stable causality that was first invoked in order to talk about a hypersurface broadhead becoming. So uh, a broadhead who follows this uh, strategy will eliminate fewer models of orthodox general relativity than occurred in section two. And uh, one would <coughs> envisage that one could carry over from the Newtonian discussion ideas for a less cheating construction, how it would need extra c conditions, and how one might assess those. Jeremy, sorry, do you want yeah. to take some um, clarification? I'm sorry. Or do you want to wait uh, for no, me? I'll take a... No, yeah, sorry, I didn't notice you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say this in the end, but I just can't keep quiet. You're bringing in a moral aspect here, Jeremy, which... Oh. When, you meant, when you use words like cheating, theft, and honest spoil. Now, the question is, who is stealing from whom here? I mean, you keep... You're assuming that we just have all these solutions of the Einstein equations, the, you know, the, the blockhead has them, and the broadhead is stealing those, and right. But we don't, obviously we don't, I mean, you know, is the solution, you know, using some massive supercomputer to solve the Einstein equations for, for inspiring black holes, is that honest toil? And if it is, then the blockhead is stealing from from those who are solving the Einstein equations. So, so it's I I don't like this terminology of of, of cheating. <laughs> yes, um, so it will be. I mean, your construction is you know it's it's off perfectly clear, but on the other hand, <coughs> calling the truncation of this block universe, which we're sort of somehow is the is owned by the blockhead is not right. It's not, it's not fair. It's not a fair way, it's a fair use of language to call it a cheat. Yeah. But you should be happy because you're a non-cheater in your way of thinking, according to... You're the honest one in your way of thinking, if I understand correctly, you and him, which is very honest. Right? Isn't she the non-cheater? You mean... Uh, by being a a, by, a, bro a broadhead person. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Well. Yeah. Uh, well. Uh, the blockhead is doing no scientific work. It's just sitting there, uh, complacent, perhaps proud, so arguably complacent. Uh, the broadhead is doing what you might call metaphysics of physics or uh, foundations of physics type work, and they can choose how ambitious to be in delivering back these Newtonian or GR models that the blockhead is envisaging. I, I do take your point. I mean, it's no defense for me to say I merely am following Ehrman's use of cheating and n not cheating, because I fell into his way of talking happily. <laughs> so, yes, I mean, I think you're right. There is a sort of uh, parlor game, game atmosphere to the way I'm discussing what is general relativity or what is Newtonian theory. Gravitation theory. Yeah, Nick also wants to.
you're measure of how much you're stealing is how much of the block you assume. So by that scale, the person who just assumes the whole block is the biggest achievement of all. Yeah. 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 That's this allocation of blame okay. and wait until the end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. We better yeah, get to the end. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I try to say it less, but in any case, I stand, <laughs> I stand accused and probably convicted here. Yeah. Um, okay, so a final comment, final two slides about the idea of the world line becoming. Um, in some space times, for some world lines, it's true that if you take the union of the past light cones along the world line, you do not get the entire space time. You get less than it. And uh, in particular, there are some space-times, like De Sitter space-time, in which that's true for all world lines, because of the uh, acceleration, so that nobody who lasts forever event and collects all the data from their entire past light cone uh, is fortunate enough to see everything that ever happens. Well, this actually gives an application to these metaphysical disputes of a, of a, uh, a collection of ideas which... Uh, was put forward long ago by Gleamore and Malamant, philosophers of general relativity, and taken up recently by Malamant's student Manchak, about the idea of one relativistic model being in observationally indistinguishable from another. So the idea is that um, one model is observationally indistinguishable from another if uh, for all... Uh, uh, for all world lines in the one, there's a world line in the other for which uh, the past light cones of the world lines, taken as the unions of the past light cones of the points on the world lines, are isomorphic. And yet the, the idea is R and R dashed are not themselves isomorphic. Um, the, the gist of the theorems of Manchak and Malamant, I've got some references on the final slides, is that almost every relativistic space-time is observationally indistinguishable from another, and that the other one can lack any or all of four global properties that you can imagine the initially given one to have. I won't go into what those mean, but one of them is this global hyperbolicity that we mentioned before. And blockheads, like me, read this as epistemic underdetermination, the idea is that even an ideal observer in R who lives forever and observes the entire field content of their past light cone, namely J minus gamma, cannot know much about the global structure of her space-time. Uh, now, presumably, broadheads would read this as a sort of ontic underdetermination. They envisage that they have some becoming model, curly B, specified in some way they consider, sorry, Faye, sorry, everybody, non-cheating, so they would expect Manchak theorems to imply that something like A or any or a generic broadhead model B can have as its ideal completion two blockhead models, R and R dash, that could differ on global properties like I listed, like global hyperbolicity or spatial isotropy. So for the broadhead, there would be no fact of the matter about such properties. And it struck me, this is not in Ehrman, that this is a bit like a fragment of constructivist mathematics that's embeddable into two different, less constructivist fragments. But the constructivist would say there's no fact of the matter about which is the right extension of my uh, doctrine that, by which I stand. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me let me now try and quickly do the second half. Okay, this is a, this is, I think shorter in terms of the number of slides involved. There's only four or five slides. Uh, logicians have long studied models of formal languages with a future branch in time. As I mentioned in discussion with George, I think yesterday, some models include an actual future. At, at each point in the tree, one of its future branches is privileged. Uh, I never mentioned this to Hugh, but you know, uh, as regards the the conference, but it's a little bit unfortunate. Logic type schools of thought not represented. Uh, Belknap and others study branching space-time models. Their idea 
is that there's going to be a causal temporal precedence relation written less than. Uh, it is a dense and connected partial order on a set W of point events, and each lower bounded chain has an infimum, and they have two main uh, ideas, and I'll have to use the board. This, of course, slows the talk down. Um, but um, you will have um, often got the idea then that, uh, well, Let me put it this way, never mind choice. Oh, I should say two under choice. I'm sorry, it still has the one. Branching is, uh, we're going to define uh, a, a, a history, a possible history, little h. It's a set of points that's maximal in two properties. It's downward closed in the sense that given an x and a y less than x, then y is itself in h. It is also upward directed in that given any two points, x and y, there is some point z which is uh, greater than both of them. So I want you to imagine uh, something like uh, this picture where you have Minkowski space-time and some point in it at which some binary point event occurs either one way or another leading to two different histories in the future light cone of that point. We'll discuss briefly, shortly, whether this point is itself to be labelled red or blue according to which way it goes, or whether the stochasticity is only future to it. This will relate to whether or not this uh, resulting construction has the property of Horsdorfness or not. But just naively imagine that history goes a certain way in the Minkowski space-time, and this is shown here, but at a certain point an event could go one or other of two ways, and according to how it goes, the contents of its future light cone will differ. Hence I have drawn two what you might call leaves, which join on the boundary of this future light cone to indicate that, of course, this uh, stochasticity has no influence in what we saw already in Carlo's talk yesterday, is the elsewhere, the space-like, re the space, the region of points that are space-like related to the given one. So the idea of a history is that it is to be not the entire picture, but either the back leaf, of which you, which you don't see all of because of the occlusion from the front leaf, or to be the front leaf. Okay, that's the history. And it's clear, you see, that here, this point and this point are uh, x and y. There's going to be, up here, some z, which is uh, causally connectable in the history to both x and y. Okay. Choice is uh, put forward by Belknap and others as um, uh, a principle governing such a, such a point here, uh, that the choice event is uh, in the intersection of the two histories, and it's maximal in that intersection, and it's, it's less than uh, uh, every element in this chain that's specifying it. So the main point about choice is that uh, uh, it's in both histories. So. The idea here is that the splitting event or the choice event does not show its colours. It is not itself either red or green. It is not. It, it is the uh, the mother of the different of the divergence, but it does not itself uh, display. It's not thus to be copied. It's it's in in it's in both the histories. It's in common between them. It's maximal in their intersection. So. I chose L, capital L equals 2 for my diagram, right? But in general, one builds copy, one builds models of this uh, set of axioms of Belknap by taking copies of Minkowski space-time. Jeremy, it's not yeah. the only point. Sorry. Is it's not the only point which is in both histories. No, 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 that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. 
So these axioms are actually very logically weak. Uh, uh, but this school of thought has undertaken formal investigations of various irreducibly stochastic events and that they've even written papers that give kind of schematic models of the violation of Bell inequalities. And I just want to end, uh, I think this is my last two slides, uh, okay, my last three slides, uh, by saying if we were to try to bring this scheme more, more closely in contact with physics, we need to do, be, to do various things. The first thing, which I haven't stressed at all so far, is that we need to be aware that indeterminism in physics and in its philosophy is usually analysed not in terms of the branching of a single solution or space-time model or possible world, but rather in terms of uh, what is called in the philosophy literature divergence. There are two solutions. They are isomorphic up until a certain time, and then they diverge thereafter. So they're not isomorphic as a whole, but they have initial segments that are isomorphic. It's not that some single solution is actually breaking up. Obviously, we need to choose a physical theory to guide how we strengthen the axioms. And uh, we need to bear in mind that that physical theory may have formal obstacles to branching. And if we are actually not thinking of divergence, distinct models that are isomorphic to a certain time, but not isomorphic thereafter, but are actually thinking of uh, genuine branching, then there are many theorems, or various, a handful of theorems in general relativity, that branching space-times are not physical. Uh, and the fi final main remark here is that if we wish to add a topology to the branching space-time framework, then overlapping histories generally make that topology non-Hallsdorf. And here, uh, I just draw a picture of um, two pictures of um, the situation you can have. This is a copy of the real line, but you've, you've uh, made two copies of the number zero and everything above it. So this is a branching version of the real line. So these are the negative numbers here, uh, but zero and all the positive numbers, you've got two copies. Hence the square bracket to indicate the inclusion of zero here, right? On the other hand, I can make a copy where I put zero in the uh, uh, left-hand half, including zero just the once, and this kind of scenario is not Hallsdorf, never mind the definition, but it is locally Euclidean in the sense that uh, every point has a neighborhood that's homeomorphic to a patch of Euclidean space. This is Hallsdorf, but it's not locally Euclidean. And broadly speaking, you can't have both and you need to choose. And the, what I called the principle of choice in which the splitting event did not declare its colors. It was not either red or green, but not both. That was uh, maximal in the common history. That was this case, right? Um, so uh, there are choices to be made. What Belknap and Patsek, in a re reply to Ehrman, point out is that their individual histories are Hallsdorf in a condition that they call indeterminism without choice. They have non-Hallsdorf topology in the branching structure as a whole. Muller, more recently, urges uh, that it's good reason to sacrifice the Hallsdorf and to keep the local Euclideanness. Okay, so broadly speaking, uh, I urge since time is out, that we don't know much about this and that the, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to build realistic models of branching space times. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jeremy. Um, as you pointed out, most people who think about stochastic processes don't think in terms of branching space time, but, you know, what solutions that agree for a, for a while and then diverge. Yeah. Now, 
if I used to think of it that way, can I get a branching space time by just taking two solutions and saying, well, if these initial se segments are just isomorphic, but then I identify the initial segments and put them in the same space time? Uh, is it as easy as that? Uh, yes. I, th even that is not clear to me. Uh, it's true that, uh, for example, in this most recent thing by Muller, called, which I've called 2012, it's been on the archive for a, for a year actually, uh, he, he identifies like that. He takes L copies of Minkowski space-time and then uh, carefully identifies them in everything but the future light cone of various points. Yeah. But how general is this construction uh, is uh, very open. Actually, he, it, because he takes L to be a finite integer, he makes, there are only, you know, finitely many points and the thing is uh, more or less mm, uh, as mathematically tractable as the case with one point so to speak. It's when you imagine uh, yeah. an infinite really set of points with an accumulation awesome. point yeah. and a dense set of points and then there will be great difficulties in maintaining uh, local Euclidean-ness or Horsdorf-ness. There seems to be uh, no literature on this, says Muller, and well, very little literature, though the choice he makes of going with the locally Euclidean and sacrificing Horsdorf corresponds to what Visser did in a, in a book that some physicists may know called Lorentzian Wormholes. So there's been some discussion in the physics literature. I guess my real question is, though, is there an advantage to thinking of it this way versus the, the um, or, or ordinary? Because this seems uh, like putting these space times together into branching space times creates problems like, you know, this branch point, you throw that. Whereas if I just think it in the ordinary way, I've got these solutions that diverge. Um, oh, yes. I don't seem to have those kind of problems. And the question is, is there a corresponding advantage to thinking of it the way that Belknap and Mueller would like yeah. us to? Oh, th sorry, yes. That's a, um, that, that, that's a question that's much more friendly for me. The, uh, I mean, I think it, my general remark that we don't know much uh, applies <laughs> both uh, to the Belknap school, but also to those who believe in divergence. I think it would be, as I was discussing with some people, you, Raphael, Fay, yesterday, stochastic processes in a Lorentz invariant setting are, I think, ill understood. So even those of us who believe in divergence as a representation of indeterminism in general have our work to do to get a handle on the details of Lorentz invariant stochastic processes. But with any luck, we will be able to do it with the notion of indeterminism as mere divergence. I would like to do that. It is true that the Belknap School have a draft paper against the divergence conception of indeterminism. I think they are constructing a rod for their own back, since they will be then facing the kinds of problems that I was alluding to in my first answer to you. I hope that they will be wrong in the critique <coughs> of the Montague Ehrman et al. orthodoxy that indeterminism should be understood as divergence, because if they are wrong, then it's a rod only for their back. If they're right, my goodness, things are worse for all of us, Montague Ehrman, you, me, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jeremy, two, two comments. Um, thank you for an interesting paper. Firstly, I'm finding it interesting to try to restrict cosmological models to models which are relevant to actual observations. So the question, this word observer, what does it refer to, you see? Now, uh, in terms of the past, what matters for what's happening in this room is not J minus P. It's a much, much smaller part of the past, because what matters is where did the particles in this room come from? And that's a tiny, tiny part of the past. It's not J minus B. Yeah. Similarly to the future, um, you, can, you can talk about what happens if, if, if 
observers of for infinity, but actually observers are not going to look for infinity. Uh, the, the, the maximum plausible to the future, future will be two times the Hubble time, let's say another 14 billion years, and that's the end of what is plausibly ever going to be seen by anyway. In a sense, it's quite interesting to sort of let's talk about realistic observers and not unrealistic okay. ones. The, the other comment is about branching to the future. Now, I was promoting this uh, idea that you can't predict to the future, but actually, what you can do to the future is restricted by possibilities related to conservation laws. And for a little time to the future, we can <coughs> predict with quite a lot of um, certainty. As you go further to the future, the degree to which we constrain what we have with this is, is diverging. So in a sense, the paths to the future are diverging paths in which we can be pretty sure what will happen a couple of microseconds from now. We can't be very sure what will happen a couple of thousand billion years ago. And so it's quite interesting to have diverging possibilities. As well. Right, right. Uh, Yes, I, I I agree with both your comments, of course. I, I certainly, in a way, you've heard me talk about these observationally indistinguishable space times yeah. before, 50 months ago, and you emphasized, as your written work does over years, with great uh, de wonderful detail, the kind of, I mean, general relativity isn't an armchair subject, but boy, when you talk about these eternally living observers, uh, or the dynasty of <laughs> of uh, eternal observers, it, it gets to look a bit armchair so, to the average practicing so, cosmologist. Yeah. <laughs> in cosmology, the idea of the event horizon is actually, yeah. it has no content actually for cosmology. So yeah. the, the particle horizon is key, but the event yeah. horizon not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yes, yeah, so, I mean, the underdetermination issues are much more savage and practical than this kind of Malum and Manchak general theorems suggest, yeah, yeah, so. Sam. So this is a point of clarification about the relativity of the growth law. So there's arbitrariness worries about just picking a world line, going with that and using that to define the sequence of light points which defines the, the growing block. To get around those arbitrariness worries, I thought you would do something like what George did, which is tie together a whole bunch of world lines, take a family of world lines and use the fact of light points those. That didn't seem to be what happened to avoid the arbitrariness type worry. So I'm just wondering if you could say a bit more about how you avoid those arbitrariness worries, in, or at least how yeah. it things. Uh, uh, yes, I, I think um, the uh, the short answer would be that the arbitrariness of a choice of world line. Uh, might be overcome in two ways. One was on my slide explicitly when discussing world lines, which was to consider all world lines. And what you just said, referring to George, uh, was a privileged class of world lines, but that would be caught by Ehrman's discussion in his earlier section about hypersurfaces. So I didn't deliberately echo, I, my slides didn't echo George's exposition as such, but George had an initial postulated surface, and then he, he had time-like eigen lines of the Ricci tensor, or more or less of the stress-energy tensor, defining later leaves of a foliation. So that would be like the hypersurface becoming. Uh, does that help? Yeah. 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 Um, I hope this... Sorry, this is a finger. This was a file of finger. Yep, sorry. It's actually a finger for, for a wedding. It's a file of finger. Um, one thing that might distinguish the two cases would be if the distinct branches could actually merge at a later time and there was some dynamical rule about how, you know, some amplitude associated with the merger or something like that. I'm just wondering, has yes. anyone considered that more general kind of uh, space time? Uh, the short answer is no. Yeah, uh, either in the kind of uh, philosophy of science tradition where indeterminism is divergence, or the uh, Belknap uh, idea that there is a genuine splitting of a single history. But yeah. th this convergence idea, if there's an attractor in the future, then it doesn't matter what the data is because it all goes to the same place in the future. So what doesn't matter? If there's an attractor yeah. in your face space. 
And then in the kind of convergence right, that's talking about will happen in practice. Yes, and sorry, it, what doesn't therefore matter if there's such a convergence? It doesn't matter where you start. Yeah. yeah. But Bernard does discuss the distinction between future indeterminism and past indeterminism. Sorry, yes, that's true. Uh, he ten there tends like not to be a cons the, the tends not to be much discussion of what theories would be like that are both pu past and future indeterministic. But any such would, of course, allow divergence followed by convergence. Yeah. yeah. Go on. Um, this is not. I hope this question doesn't sound pleasant. It's not at all meant to be, to be scientific. What have we? What is it that we have learned in the past? Uh, um, thinking about branching time in, in, in physics or in philosophy, uh, interesting enough to motivate you and John and others to think about branching space time. I think. Uh, this is a sort of rather, rather, you know, modest or disappointing answer, but just the, I think the honest answer is that there are two uh, strands of thought. It just is true. You call it a cottage industry or a parlor game or something, but it is true that in logic and philosophy with the coming of uh, logics of tense and modality, there was much discussion of branching structures towards the future, representing indeterminism. <coughs> you might say, well, what have we learned? Well, the answer is, I suppose, various rival proposals of which some linguists take notice who are interested in the representation of time in natural language. Uh, and some connections with the philosophy of determinism and indeterminism. The other thing that's happened is this, so far as I know, but others may have a, a much <coughs> richer answers to give if, from the philosophy or other disciplines. The, the Belknap School have, would say, were they here, well, we've learned quite a lot about what you can get from what axioms about space times that are not just divergent, but are postulated as branching, as having a single history that splits. I mean, they, there is, a, a, there is a, an, an unfortunate and a somewhat bad-tempered aspect to the back and forth because of how you define history. Under their formal definition of history, a history does not split. And as I mentioned on the slide, they prove it that in their favored topology, which is essentially given by the Alexandrov diamonds, all histories are, have a Hall's, the subspace topology on any history is Hallsdorf, right? So his, but the overall structure certainly splits. So the second part of the answer is we've learned quite a lot about what follows from what those sorts of order theoretic axioms, how to add topologies to them. But... I don't think we've learned enough in that literature to have a lot to say in detail about indeterministic physical theories, I'm afraid. Yeah. But maybe other people may have a, a more substantive answer. Yeah. This may probably be what this sort of also reminds me of, of course, is sort of many worlds branching. So I guess I wonder if this is supposed to, I was going to ask this in the question, is this supposed to be that. Actually, my question was more to do with how do the, how do the is there any connection between sort of the number of branches? This is the question in many worlds. Do the, the number of branches correlate with the probability of going from one branch rather than the other? Or is this all the um, Yes. Well, uh, I, I think there is a there is a uh, a probably a consensus answer to both parts of your question, not because there's clear consensus about how to think of Everett, perhaps, but I would say that the, well, first of all, the papers I'm citing don't talk about Everett, 
Okay. So, but it is true that most Everettians now, like Oxford School, would tend to say that their branching is an effective and approximate macroscopic thing. And the whole spirit of Ehrman's papers uh, or the Belknap School is that we are imagining that general relativity is our fundamental theory or some other specific theory is on the table as our fundamental theory. And or we're doing logic and semantics and we're envisaging some fundamental indeterminism, but we haven't told you what physical theory is uh, giving this indeterminism. But the whole uh, atmosphere of discussion is that any such branching is fundamental rather than effective. So it doesn't really map onto how most Everettians now discuss branching. It's also true that when the Belknap School talk, add probabilities, probability weights to their various possible histories, they are certainly not induced by a counting measure on histories, which I think is a merit myself, <coughs> since counting measures are, uh, you know, broadly, you know, a foolish naivety that we should grow out of in order to construct our measures. Uh, one final figure and then lunch. Uh, so I'm curious as to whether it might, if not ever, it might relate to something like Penrose's idea of superposed geometries. I mean, how else would you represent what's going on in those cases? Uh, well, my hunch is I agree. I mean, he draws this picture, actually. Right. In, uh, in, I was mentioning to, I think, Fael Raphael, he, in 1979, in the Israel Hawking <coughs> Einstein Centenary Survey Papers Green Book, he draws this picture briefly. <coughs> um, so I forget what his discussion, it is a direction of time discussion by him. Uh, but yeah, I think we all draw these pictures when we first think, how would I put genuine stochasticity into uh, special relativity. We draw a picture like that. And if you imagine that matter does actually uh, curve space-time, which is exactly the context of superposing that, that Penrose and you are discussing, then, yeah, it would be, as I said, I'm kind of going to make the discussion simple and have a, uh, a non-dynamical space-time. But one is up against this kind of picture, yeah. On that note, we should yeah. uh, thank Jeremy D. Frost. <laughs>